and Public Relations at Timbuktu Publishers. I'm really excited. I'm very excited and extremely proud to be your hostess for the launching of Capitalist Nigger, Dr. Nyani's latest masterpiece. Timbuktu Publishers have provided drinks and light refreshments for everyone, and I do urge you to help yourselves. Piku and Jewel from Palava Hut Caterers. Hi, ladies. <laughs> They've really outdone themselves, so do partake. If you have any questions or need anything this afternoon, do not hesitate to come over and ask me. Because I can assure you, when it comes to encouraging you to generously support this book launching, I will not hesitate to ask any one of you. Welcome once again, and uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our uh, MC. Well, he's actually missing in action, so um, I think Chika Anyali Jr. is standing in for us. And he's going to be our MC, if you can get his notes down quickly. Thank you.
what fraudulent has not yet been invoked. So it has been a miscount, as they have said, and uh, we hope they are able to arrive at the decision soon. Having said that, I am ecologically excited as a capitalist nigger that Chief Dr. Onyane has finally found what I'm about, and that is to be a capitalist nigger. All protocols observed, Your Excellencies. Now, the place we are when I walked in was about the libation, which, of course, we want our ancestral niggers to know what we are doing today, and that means involving someone to come and propitiate the government. And uh, it has been designated to Chief Aronsi Chuku. Uh, if you are not an evil man, the word Chuku means God. So uh, uh, Chief Aronsi Chuku, Aronsi God, will then do the proposition of colonel for us. In the absence of colonel, which is a very wrong season now, uh, we will have a libation which, again, our ancestors do love.
But um, I, after I read the book, I realized that it didn't matter who wrote this book. If he was a white guy, if people with um, reasonable minds read the book, they will understand that it had nothing to do with being black or white. Um, again, I spoke to an African-American friend of mine in New Jersey. Uh, he was reasonable. He said to me, I will probably read the book, but the title seemed very insulting to us, and that's a quote. So he was a little bit reasonable in his comment. Now, why were these comments made? It's very clear. If you have read the book, and I encourage everyone to read it, a lot of controversial comments. Some of them, actually most of them are true. A few of them I object, and uh, we lawyers we know how to object. And I already told Dr. Nyan and some of them. But let me quote a couple of them. He says, and I quote, we are a consumer race. We produce nothing and consume what others produce. These are quotes. Thirdly, he said, we lack the killer instinct of the Caucasian race. And I agree with him to a very large extent. But then, you know, he's pulling the bull by the horn. And I admire him for that. Again, the, the controversy of all controversies is the title of the book itself. So, but those are some of the things that I noted that are raising a lot of discussions. And I've had a lot of discussions uh, about this book with my colleagues and friends. A lot of emails were exchanged, and it is very hard. Now, there is no doubt that the word nigger is probably the most outrageous word, the most offensive word in English, or in any other language. I don't know if there's a similar word in Igbo or Hausa, but if there, if there is, it will still be very offensive. So why did Dr. Nyane choose the title? Dr. Nyane, why did you choose? Well, I will, I'll help you out. I will explain why you choose the title. Don't be scared. I'm not calling you to come and defend at this moment. <laughs> anyway, let me put Dr. Nyane. He said, I decided to write Capitalist Nigger to open a debate on the state of the African race. Again, close quote. Another quote, he says, even the title of this book is bound to make a lot of people angry. So he realized that, you know, he's trading in very rough area. And um, I think he's ready. He's probably a gladiator. He's ready to fight the book. Now, what is in the name? Let me, I mean, a lot of us that went to college or even high school, you, you're taught that a name given to something is arbitrary. It's just a name. Sometimes they call me my brother's name and I turn around. If I just walk like I didn't even hear it, they wouldn't call me that name. So when you turn and, and say, oh, yeah, it's me, you're giving some, you know, you're, you're listening to the person calling you that name, and as long as you're giving the person some audience, it's bound to be calling you that name. And I, quoting Dr. Nyan again, he said, what is really in a word? We make it what we want it to mean. By accepting what others want us to believe the word means, we are invariably giving them the satisfaction of feeling a superiority over us. But when we hardly notice such an appellation as meaningless, it not, only, it not only makes the user of the word totally stupid, it also make, takes away his feeling of superiority. And he went further and reaffirmed a Nigerian proverb, although he calls it African proverb, but I think it's a Nigerian proverb. Uh, it says, it is not what you call me, but what I answer to the matter most. And a lot of us here from Nigeria, you know that that is a fact. So, in summary, unlike the MC said, or uh, he made some comments in passing, this book doesn't call anybody a nigger. The book is just telling us to get up from our protracted hibernation and grab a piece of the apple. It is so big, and we're not grabbing it. We have to grab it. That's all the book is talking about. You know, and I'll tell you what, as much as I've heard people talk about this book, the title of it, I've never heard anybody say that the facts contained therein are false. 
So it's all about the book. And I tell them, look, don't rush the title to judgment. Just read it first. You know? And good thing, this book is not just about African Americans. It's about Africans here in the diaspora, Africans in the homelands. So there is no isolation here. And quoting Dr. Uh, Dr. Nian, uh, because the, he went ahead and, and tried to attack the forces, the, the leaders of Africa that has, you know, messed up with our economy, if I use that word, I apologize. But he attacked them and he tries to get us to be focused. And now I understand why Dr. Nian is seldom wears um, anything other than a black, I mean, uh, an African made dress. Actually, after reading this book, I realized why uh, Paul was wearing a suit today. But uh, capitalist nigger is not about condemning any race. It's about telling us to appreciate ourselves, get involved with one another, and do something for ourselves. Now, let me quote Dr. Nyani here. True, and I, I started to quote, true buffoonery, utter mismanagement, and downright stealing of the wealth of the masses. These leaders have so improvised Africa that we are now nothing but a beggar continent. And that is true, and Nigeria is a big example here. I apologize to some of our leaders, but that's a fact. You know, uh, we're supposed to be one of the richest countries in the world, but we don't have so we, have, we don't have much to show for it. It's supposed to be one of the educated race. Uh, group of people in the world, but we have barely nothing to show for it. And it, it's, well, Dr. Nyane wants that to change. And look at it, after so many decades of, of uh, independence, in quote, we're still unable to run our affairs effectively. We can't build and manage our industry, drill and refine our oils and sell the oil. We have to depend on other people. Not to say that we shouldn't give employment to other people. We should give them employment, but we have to train our own people too to have a share. You know. So, and then you come down here in America. You look at the black folks here. What have they done for themselves? Now, after so many years of the end of racism, you know, the black, uh, the African Americans, as they are now known still way behind. And Dr. Nyani compares us to the Indians, the Jews, the Chinese. He's, and he's saying that we haven't done much. Because some of these guys, you know, they came here not too long ago, but we have been here for centuries. The excuses of racism is there, of course, but Dr. Nyani is saying, and look, I give him a lot of credit here because he not only talks about what is bad, what is wrong, he talks about how we can make things work. He talks about what he calls, quote, the spider web economic policy. Wherever he got that name, but you all know what a spider is. When that web is made, anything flying into it is sucked in there and remains there, becomes part of the system. So Dr. Nyan is saying we have to use that method. And what does that mean? It's just very simple. We have to set up our industry. Hire most of our people sometimes, you know, in, in suitable cases. And look at the Chinese. They come here with nothing most of the time, set up their, their restaurants, and they sell their fried rice and broccoli. They hire their people most of the time. And you look at it. The Chinese, you hardly ever see them in McDonald's stores. I mean, uh, restaurants. You hardly see them. Not to say that they don't go, but it's very rare. And Dr. Nyani is not preaching isolation, no. But it's, for the most part, we have to appreciate our people. We have to eat most of our food. We have to wear most of our, our clothing. And that's all he's saying. And um, narrowing down now, I just have one, two more minutes. Do I have two minutes? No. One minute. Okay, okay good. <laughs> so, and and um, some of the lessons that I've learned from this book, and. Uh, there's a, uh, a musician in Nigeria, he's dead now, his name is Sawore. Some of us from the eastern part know him. Uh, he, there was a song he, he sang some time ago. He says, don't eat toads. You know toads as against frogs. But if you have to eat toads, you have to eat a big one. So when they call you a toad eater, you say, yes, I am. You know? So by analogy, Dr. Nyan is saying, look, we're not 
niggas. You shouldn't call us niggas. Uh, but um, if we're going to be niggas, we might as well be capitalist niggas. We, you know, and a capitalist nigger, and I quote him, a capitalist nigger is an economic worry. A capitalist nigger understands that failure is never an option. A capitalist nigger wears the badge of being called a nigger as a badge of success. So if they're going to call us niggers, let's be capitalist nigger. Let's go out there and grab probably one of the most important social um, powers, which is economic power. We have, let's grab it. And uh, finally, for those of us who think that the name or the title of this book should have been different, uh, let me suggest the title, but it's just for your mind. You can change the title of this book in your mind to read The Road to Economic Independence, The Story of the Black Race. But the book itself, let it remain titled as Capitalist Nigga, The Road to Success, because the contents of the book explains the title, and not the other way around. If you look at the title, you're going to drop the book. The book, the content itself, explains very clearly the title. I thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Barrister. Um, as, you say, as they say, uh, anywhere you get attorneys, they give you one summons. But this one was well thought about, well thought out, and uh, was packed with a lot of uh, 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 truth in it. And before I introduce the next attorney that would dissect the book also, uh, let me just uh, uh, beg to differ with uh, the articulate uh, Placidus Agoa. Let the name of the book remain as it is. We need to sell it. And, and, and uh, there are many people that will open their mind and say, what is this all about? And then feel challenged. As I mentioned to Kwesi Mfume in 1998, I said the NAACP should not only be a political uh, activist party, they should begin to think about transfer of technology to Africa. They should begin to think about entering into deals with the Nigerian government to take oil, refine it in Texas, and create filling stations in African-American neighborhoods and challenge Texaco and Mobile. That's what a capital sneaker should be about. Um, those who play basketball should begin to put their funds together and say Nigeria has vast mineral resources. Let's go into Nigeria and recolonize Nigeria. And uh, Nigeria, as you had mentioned, um, was poorly managed, but it's still a wonderful country that took a 30-year hiccup, the, long, the longest hiccup one can ever envisage a nation taking. But it's coming back to what it should be. And as God will give it, the, the, the nation having talents such as you, and, and, and myself and uh, our, our servant sitting over there, the, the Consul General, will turn around and be what it should be as a nation where everyone's rights will be respected and then industries will become very, very active as they are in Western of industrialized nations. Having said that, uh, let me bring in um, Ken Ramsar Esquire to again dissect the book. Thank you. Dr. Nyani, and other dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to correct something that I, I had to tell people, uh, and I hope it's somewhat in the fashion of Dr. Nyani's book, that people say I'm an attorney, which I am, but I was many other things before I became an attorney, and I acquired many other skills before I became an attorney, and I never lost those skills. And one of those skills I like to think was, to help me survive, was I was always very ruthless. I was very cold and I was very pragmatic. It did not endear me to my neighborhood, but I'm here to talk about it, and the others who are not. I salute Dr. Ugnani for being a visionary and for having the courage to write a book such as Capitalist Nigger. He reminds me of many other gifted people, not the Fridays, but rather than talk about it, he did it. For those of you who have not read the book, I can assure you that it's a very awkward, very painful, very challenging read. But when you deal with truth and honesty, there's sometimes no shortcuts available. 
I read the book through the eyes of African American. I know this country, I know it well, I know its institutions, governments, etc. I, uh, before I became a lawyer, I was a historian. I've never lost that skill. I've had the benefit of some of the finest African American teachers this nation has ever produced. As an attorney, I've been blessed and benefited by representing giants in law, in music, in literature. I've learned from all of them. They've been Grammy winners, Nobel Prize winners. And Dr. Oyani, in his very modest fashion, is like a colossus that he can stride both continents with equal facility. This is something that as African Americans we lack, in my opinion, in our leadership and in others, but most of our leaders, if you take them past their neighborhood, they don't have the vision to understand or interrelate what is really happening. As pointed out by my brother Charlie, Dr. Adami talks to us about our societies being consumers. In reading the book, I respectfully submit to Dr. Nyang that you must too modest. Besides the fact that we are consumers exclusively, we have, in fact, in the 21st century, positioned ourselves to be the waste population for all societies and all countries. And by waste population, I mean that we are, for all practical purposes, superfluous. We are the waste population because they need guards who are Caucasian to guard us in prison. We're the waste population because we don't educate our children so they need remedial teachers, they need all kinds of therapy, all kinds of psychiatrists, etc. We're the waste population because we do not plan adequately for our families, so therefore we need all kinds of daycare centers and so forth. I don't mean to sound inhumane about that, but years ago I criticized our national leadership. They were talking about daycare centers, and I was telling them, why don't you have the defense department put a defense contract in your neighborhood? It's devastated already. If you have a defense contract, you provide jobs. And people can make a living. They will learn skills. But as African American, I, I criticize the vision of some of our leaders, not all of our leaders. One of the things Dr. Onyani talked about that struck a chord with me, he used the word corporate throughout the book. And corporate essentially means an entity, an operation that has no mortality. A corporation has perpetual life. I contrast that with our limited vision, how we will take individuals, put them on the pedestal of their stars, but once they go, the star is over. And I refer to some of our outstanding athletes. They're making fortunes. They're very talented, they're very skilled. Uh, Michael Jordan, maybe the greatest basketball player of all time, the highest paid basketball player of all time. What's that have to do with his family? How do you perpetuate that? It's a skill. It's over when his career is over. Bill Cosby, a, a very gifted, very talented musician, makes a lot of money. How does Bill Cosby perpetuate that? So I call upon all of us, African Americans, and men and women from the mother country, the mother continent, part of it is making a sacrifice. Everybody cannot be number one. Everyone can't be a star. Male egos get involved. Nationalities get involved. And therefore, as the history of humankind has always demonstrated, we see these pictures of children with arms cut off, legs cut off, victims of the horror of, of war. And these children, are so young, they don't even know what country they are members of. So, in looking at Dr. Ognani's book, Capitalist Nigger, I think we have to take that in perspective and have the courage and the vision to make those adjustments for the 21st century. Surely, if we don't make them, the rest of the continents will. For those of you who have been to Asia, I don't think there's any such thing as unemployment in Asia. You'll see everybody, young men, young women, doing some kind of labor, maybe meaningful, but they're learning how to bargain, how to sell. They're learning how to manufacture and produce. 
They're learning about that economic trail to follow from production to marketing. Or they might be starting off selling boats, of course, or they might be selling something like radios. But in due time, they're learning the same basic values that it takes to run a business or a multinational corporation. So, as I said before, being a capitalist nigga is a very painful deed. And I'm sure that many people will pick it up and they'll put it down because it's painful. But in my viewpoint, it is a must be if you call yourself a responsible citizen and you say you're serious about the 21st century and you're establishing it, that of your family, that of your children, I think it's a must read. So I'm called upon, once again, to salute Dr. Adonali for having the courage and vision to put this down. The only question I have, and it's my fault, and perhaps the fault of everyone in this room, why did somebody do this 25 years ago? Why not 30 years ago? These situations we talk about now, they did not come up overnight. We watched it evolve for several generations, especially post-World War II. We've learned the lesson, we know the lesson, so what are we gonna do about it? So, I strongly recommend everyone of good spirit and good mind to read this book. My viewpoint, is that it should almost be a family Bible. And once again, I warn you, this is not the kind of book you want to read at night, next to your nightstand, because maybe Charlie didn't go to sleep. But Dr. Nani, I, I thank you. I always like challenges. And in reading your book, I had to uh, look at myself in the mirror. But then I had to turn away because nobody I had no made the mirror. <laughs> so we have our work to do. <laughs> ever had uh, a pre-malaria attack uh, and you go to any of the hospitals in Nigeria, the first injection you receive is almost a novel gene. And if you have had a novel gene while standing, uh, believe me, uh, you will capitulate uh, to the pains of novel genes. So this book, uh, according to Ramso, is like a novel gene. Uh, it's very painful. And my ancestors also believe that the truth is always painful. So we must deal with it. And I thank you for being very frugal with your commentary. And uh, I would also like to interject here, uh, um, AGOA, African Growth and Opportunity Act. When I argued against Jesse Jackson Jr., he thought that establishing the bill and passing the Congress is another form of colonization of Africa. And he debated against that. And I tried to tell him that it is important that AGOA is signed into a bill because he allows a capitalist nigger like me and him to go back to Africa and take advantage of those proceedings that AGOA provides. And this way we can produce and sell back to the capitalist coalition. And uh, I thank God that under Clinton that the bill was passed. So it is also another opportunity for a would-be capitalist mega to take advantage of the African Growth and Opportunity Act. Nigeria is ready for it. Now, when this book was being uh, written, uh, uh, I'm quite sure uh, uh, a lot of things uh, did happen uh, um, internally uh, uh, by way of implosion, family implosion, and, and, and uh, I wasn't there, but I know it happened because uh, I, I know Dr. Nani uh, uh, very well. And uh, I went and picked up my own book on Thanksgiving Day and read it and read it and read it. And I don't want to quote what I read because I've had the Honorable Attorneys do that first. And if I am to quote it, then you wouldn't want to buy the book. Um, I will call on Chika Onyani II to come and give us a narration of uh, the chronology of events uh, since the publication. Um, where are you, Chika Onyani II, please? Yes. Quite frugal also because uh, there are other people that will be saying things. 
Good afternoon again, everyone. I'd just like to start by saying I'm very happy to be here, very proud of my father, uh, here at the launching of Capitalist Nigger. And I'd just like to say that this definitely was a book that was centuries in the making. I must confess that when I first heard this title, I was a little apprehensive, like I'm sure most of you were. I had been conditioned to think that the word nigger represents something bad or negative. All my life, anytime another race wanted to really put down a member of my race, all they had to do was use the word nigger. Well, this word nigger has created a stigma associated with Africans and African Americans, which results in them being perceived as a race which is hobbled by ignorance, and a lack of drive to succeed or a strength in their convictions. Well, my father, Dr. Onyani, has treated the word nigger the way people should have treated it long ago. What he has done through capitalist nigger is strip this word of its negative connotations and in fact empowers it by redefining it to describe those Africans and African Americans who are fighting for what they believe in and using every ounce of their strength to achieve their goals and plans which they laid out before themselves. In fact, by positioning the word capitalist in front of the word nigger, Dr. Ognani has redefined the word even further to now represent an individual of African heritage who employs street and book smarts to outwit those that will keep him or her down while at the same time manipulating the system to climb up the socioeconomic food chain. Capitalist nigger, the book that you will be buying, thank you, is a book so powerful and truthful that anyone who reads it dare not dispute the contents within. It started as a whisper and has evolved into a shout which no man or woman can ignore or deny, no matter how hard you try. This book, Capitalist Nigger, is a total summation of the current state of black consciousness and existence, not just here in America, but everywhere around the world. It begs you to finally look inward and tell yourself to drop the charade because you've been found out. Let me ask a question. Does anyone here realize that the black race as a whole is truly an endangered species with nothing and no one stopping it from achieving extinction one day? Many of us, myself included, are quick to blame others, including the main scapegoat, the man, when things don't go our way. However, ladies and gentlemen, I hate to burst your bubble, but capitalist nigger does entertain that statement briefly and then proceeds to dismiss it unmercifully. No matter who you are or how many titles you may hold, the one thing that has been constant through all your struggles has been one reoccurring event, you. You have always had the power to change anything in your life that is not satisfactory. So please stop blaming the man, the media, your boss, your spouse, and your family for your problems. Now, I think that we will all agree that the black race has been beaten down over centuries. However, unlike other races, like the Jews, the Arabs, the Indians, and the Japanese, Africans, and African Americans have never announced to the world enough. We will not let anyone ever disrespect us that way again. We are the only race that gives when others push us. We are also the only race that has no true pillars of power, whether they are social, economic, political, or religious. Capitalist nigger will make you realize this and will make you want to change this mess we find ourselves in. But let me tell you what has happened since this book has been published. You see, when my father started writing this book and we started to read it, we thought that he would be scorned like Solomon Rushdie. In fact, that has not happened. And to the contrary, the book has been totally embraced because everyone acknowledges this book as ruthlessly frank and truthful. People are now going through great lengths to achieve this book. And word of mouth is driving sales of the book with very little publicity. A street vendor in Harlem has sold so many books that it is hard to keep up with his demand. A young registered nurse from Nigeria, who has very much wanted to be here today, has sold almost 20 books so far on her own. My family has also played an important part by selling these books to other family members, friends, and co-workers. 
Of course, the dynamic vice president of marketing and public relations for Timbuktu Publishers, Ms. Johnson herself, is constantly selling the book everywhere she goes on her travels. Since its publication, my father has been interviewed by the BBC World Service, by two of Africa's best broadcasters, Ogo Sal and Kolonut of WLIB, has been written up by the Baltimore Sun in a more than half page article, and of course, here with us is African American Media Network. As the book's message continues to spread, more organizations are beginning to ask him to speak to them. But please, don't take my word for it. Just listen to this portion of a letter sent to my father from Morgan State University. This letter is dated October 31st, 2000. It's addressed to Dear Dr. Oriani. In 1989, Morgan State University embarked on a new an ambitious initiative by expanding its celebration of African American History Month as a year-round observance. Each academic year, we hold a series of monthly convocations at which we highlight and commemorate the achievements of peoples of African descent around the world. And we also honor individuals and groups that have made significant contributions to our history and heritage. I am pleased to inform you that we have selected you to be the recipient of the Morgan State University Distinguished Achievement Award for 2000. And I am equally pleased to invite you to be the keynote speaker at our annual Bill of Rights, Trans-Africa Convocation on Thursday, December 9, 2000 at 11 a.m. at the Carl Murphy Fine Arts Auditorium. All Morgan freshman students, as well as a broad representation of the Morgan community and the larger Baltimore metropolitan community, will attend this convocation and we know that you will bring the kind of informative and inspirational message that they will appreciate. I am so I enclose a contract, which I hope that you will sign and return to us immediately so that we may begin to process this through the state of Maryland. I look forward to hearing from you regarding your acceptance of this offer and even more in your visit to Morgan. Now, there are many other colleges, just like Morgan State, which are also in the process of making the book required reading for their students. But the most important fact now is that Barnes & Noble has accepted the book for distribution. But it just doesn't stop there, however, because they, in turn, refer Timbuktu Publishers to the largest wholesale in the world, which is Ingram Books. Ingram Books itself decided to accord Timbuktu Publishers the same status as the major publishers, which now means that the book will be distributed throughout the country. Watch out. When that happens, I have no doubt that it will be on the New York Times bestseller. Thank you, uh, Chief Kalyani, the second. And uh, from your speech, please give a young man a hand. That's one thing we are beginning to learn as Africans. You must raise those that will take over your legacy and continue to perpetuate it. Um, the Democrats have the Kennedy family, and the Republicans are about to have the Bush dynasty. And, uh, I hope that the capitalist nigga too will depend by you, and that is the outcome of what happens after one has read this. 